Um, and now um, we'll just start with um, practical and clinical uh, case presentations. And we will have three talks. One is, is about principles of pot. Then I will push uh, the boundaries of uh, this balloon to the high risk situations with calcium and tungsten techniques. And then Delio will, back, uh, will be back to the um, basics in terms of provisional stenting strategy, which is the one uh, that will be used for most of the cases. So now, Gabor, the screen is yours. So thank you. I hope you see my slides now and I hope you hear me now. Just let yes. me know. Good. So uh, let's talk a bit about the princip principles of uh, of uh, proximal optimization, but probably so in bifurcations, the one of the major issues or the, one of the major things what you have to remember about the bifurcation anatomy that you are dealing here with three different diameters, at least three different diameters. There's diameter for the distal main branch, the side branch, and the proximal main branch. So whenever you put a stent across a bifurcation, your stent has to cope with two different dimensions. So if you put your stent proximal to distal main branch, it will be sized uh, first according to distal main branch diameter. But of course, it's a marked mismatch as compared to proximal main branch. And the larger the side branch, the greater this mismatches. So of course, this is important to keep in mind because when you put the stent, it will be massively malaposed in the proximal main branch, which has to be corrected. Here, yeah, this OCT image on the left side, this is something what you don't want to see, or I mean, you don't want to see something like this at the end of the procedure. This has to be corrected, uh, this uh, massive malaposition. So first of all, <coughs> in order to cope with this problem, you have to understand your stents, what you are using. So the stent, what you choose according to distal, distal daughter branch diameter, needs to have an expansion capacity to open up up to the size of the of the proximal main branch and for that it's important to remember that actually even though we have stents from 225 or sometimes even 20 up to 45 or larger these are much less stent platforms than diameters the difference is the balloon so if for instance if you have a look here uh, for instance, an Ultimaster stand, it has only two stand platform. The only difference between is the, the, bal the balloon on which it's mounted. So why is it important? It's important because then you know that the 2.5 balloon or the 2.5 stand or a 3.0 stand can be overexpanded to relative large diameters. But you can see here the, uh, <coughs> the expansion capacities as described by, by Nicola Fuan. Uh, bench test. So whenever I said you choose your stent according to distal uh, branch diameter, for instance, three zero, but you can easily go up to four, four, five in the main branch to correct the malaposition, uh, what you see uh, here on the left side. But as said, it's very important to understand these diameters prior stent implantation and stent selection in order you can properly cope with it. So when you put the stand, uh, as said, you put the stand according to distal uh, daughter branch diameter. And when you consider a proximal optimization, you have to keep in mind two dimensions for the proximal optimization balloon. First of all, the length. So length from carina to the proximal stand edge. So you need enough stand length fitting to your proximal optimization balloon in order you have... <coughs> you have the balloon inside the stand. And second, the diameter, the diameter of the proximal main branch to achieve a perfect apposition. So when you already implant or select the stand for the bifurcation, you have to keep in mind these two dimensions for, for the next step of the procedure, namely the length of stand in the proximal main branch and the diameter, what you want to achieve um, <coughs> for overexpansion. So, uh, there, there is a common belief, there was a common belief that by overexpansion, most stents get shortened. And, and 
we wanted to investigate this uh, shortening uh, phenomenon uh, with overexpansion to better understand how it happens. So uh, <coughs> we performed uh, bench testing to better describe and understand this longitudinal deformation by overexpansion by what? And actually a very important, very interesting observation was that uh, by overexpansion, by proximal optimization, stents get rather elongated. And this elongation, as you can see here on the left side, it's uh, not negligible. Uh, it's, it's already a couple of millimeters. Uh, for the, if you take here a three zero stent and start to overexpand three, five, four, four, five, 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 it's, it's a certain elongation or on the, on the right panel with the three, five stent overexpanding four, four, five, 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 it's uh, a reasonable elongation, which has to be keep, kept in mind uh, during um, the PCI procedure. So as you can see here, we described in bench models, uh, on the red line, you see the stent length in the proximal main branch on the blue line in uh, the stent length in the distal main branch. So these two portions of the stent and while the distal main branch part remains stable, so it was not sliding back and forth, it was remained stable. In the proximal main branch, there was a certain elongation of the stent, which is true for the three zero platforms as well for the three five platforms. Of course, we were a bit confused because this was not what we expected. Um, as one more image, it was true for, for different kind of stand brands according to two or three connector designs. It's a quite uniform observation. The said we were quite confused because this was not what we expected. The said belief was that the stands will get shortened. So we wanted to go back to uh, retrospective cases, what we performed with OCT guidance. And here I show you an example. It's a 3-5 stent implanted in an LED diagonal bifurcation. It's with this two keys line, I marked the proximal main branch part. Here you can see as the wire enters the side branch and here the distal main branch part. This is prior proximal optimization. And after proximal optimization, as you can see, it's, it's a marked elongation. So this observation, what we had in, in bench, it's valid for for real human cases as well. And here is all the cases what we have, uh, what we had in this retrospective al analysis all over the tendency of elongation. Why is it important? It's important because often we, especially for left main, where there are the mismatch between distal branch and, and left main is marked, we, we aim for a very austere, very austere position in nailing the ostium with our stent when implanting, but understanding that this elongation happens actually by, by doing the proximal optimization, this elongation will result in a, an aortic protrusion of the stent. So I'm not saying I can give you the certain uh, recipe how to avoid this problem, but I would say since this observation, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, less focused on correct osteo nailing of the stent knowing that the stent will, will elongate proximally um, anyhow. Again, as you see here, uh, this is the, uh, in this bench model, the elongation tendency of a few millimeters. <coughs> and as we described, one issue, be, one, one explanation behind this issue is actually um, due to the, the shape of most proximal optimization balloons. As you can see here is the marker and there is still a, uh, Cono tip of the balloon, uh, shoulder of the balloon, which is, if you realize how bifurcation looks like, this, this uh, shoulder of the balloon is still mainly oversized for the distal main branch. And being oversized, especially if there is some calcification, by inflating the balloon, the balloon tends to move a bit forward, move backwards, grabbing some struts and, and stretching the stands. Why? Simply because of this corner step. And, and this is where it comes, if you can see here that, um, that the uh, uh, regular balloons and, and as compared to the pot balloon, if you have a long shoulder, you can see here how oversized the shoulder for the distal, distal branch. And of course, either you over dilate here the distal branch and actually pinch the side branch or the balloon tends to move backwards 
pulling some stand material away. And this is what, what can be avoided by a balloon which has a shorter or almost no shorter. So I would like to show you here a case where, where, where this uh, issue is really uh, um, uh, obvious. This is a patient, uh, just, this is a patient with high-grade aortic stenosis, and you see here a bunch of calcium in the, in the, in the left main involving the LED, and you can see that there is a major um, uh, mismatch between the distal main branch and the left main diameter. Um, this is an old lady with aortic stenosis. Uh, so prior to we, we, uh, we plan to perform the, uh, the, uh, the PCI. It was already quite challenging to wire this LED through this uh, uh, calcified lesion. Um, when we were down, we exchanged the wire for a heavyweight. We were thinking about performing rotablator or, or any other calcification modification method, but the calcium was so eccentric that we thought that um, probably it's not the rotablator what is the best way to, to go on. But what we started here, we performed first uh, with scoring balloon modification and, and then uh, shockwave uh, uh, balloon and then uh, uh, the score flex. Uh, then they are the Wolverine once more. After that, uh, we implanted the 4-0 uh, drug eluting balloon and as you can see here, uh, proximal optimization with the pod balloon, very short, very short shoulder, allowing us to maximize the opening in the left main ostium and to avoid, um, uh, to avoid uh, overstretching of the LAD ostium. Now here we perform the kissing with the 3.5 and the 4.0 balloon. And, and with that, we can achieve the very good uh, uh, result in this uh, challenging left wing. So what I would like to deliver as memorable of this case and this uh, talk that the proximal optimization is really essential for practically any bifurcation technique, whatever you perform. You have to understand prior the expansion capacity of your stent, uh, not to get in a situation when your, your, your procedure is limited by, by the wrong stent selection. Important to remember that uh, stents tend to elongate during proximal optimization, which is important to know why you perform, uh, when, when you select your stent for and position your stent for that very case. So with these memorables, I close my talk here and I'm, I'm here and open for further questions. Thank you, Gabor, for your nice presentation. <laughs> um, well, until until any further questions are directed from the audience, I, will, I would like to ask you, um, because we are seeing now with the standard architecture and design that uh, there is one direction towards uh, ultra thin struts. Um, and there is a, a, another direction, which would be the, the, the Megatron with, with larger stand in order to get more radial force. So regarding left main, for example, uh, if the stand elongates, the footprint will be, will be uh, smaller. So there might be um, some radial force uh, lowering here. So what would be your uh, thinking? Did you test radial force when the stand elongated in this uh, Bench testing. What are your thoughts on this? So we didn't test radial force here. However, my 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 understanding on radial force, and I, I, maybe if there is an audience or in team anyone who who can help us here further, I'm I'm very happy for that. But what my understanding was always on radial force that when you think about the rings or the stand, the rings of the stand. Uh, I learned that the more circular the rings become, actually with that you increase the radial force. So it uh, sounds strange, but actually if you overexpand and let's say you stretch all the, all, the, all the rings to a complete circle, this is the moment when the radial force is the highest. What you mentioned that by overexpanding, actually the vessel to metal ratio decreases and, and therefore between two rings during this in the cells, there are more space, which is not scaffolded. So you can expect uh, uh, 
some some protrusion between between the cells so plaque protrusion this might be true on the other end i think the thin strut comp concept i believe it's more relevant in smaller vessels so actually the larger vessels you are dealing the the less relevant it is to have extremely thin struts because the vessel to strut ratio is still very very uh, very ideal so i believe in a left main the most critical position where you can put a stent i think your your most important issue is to achieve good a position so you need a stent which can open up to unlimited i would say but i, I mean you need a stent which can go up to six millimeter sure because sure but expression the, capabilities the, yeah the most the, the dramatic complications like stent thrombosis will come rather from uh, stent thrombosis due to malopposition rather than from uh, from uh, a rest anotic process so i think the most for me for a left main the most important thing is the expansion capacity of the stent Okay, so expansion <laughs> capacity on, on uh, standard size uh, struts. So there's a question from the audience here. So considering the elongation effects uh, uh, of overexpanded stent, how are you choosing now your size uh, for the pot balloon? Yeah, so <laughs> I think for such cases, imaging is very important because uh, especially left main um, uh, it's a wishful thinking that the left main is completely circular. So if you want to understand what are the real dimensions, you need imaging. And when you want to confirm that uh, you have good opposition and good opening in left main, you need imaging. So I would say that stent selection, balloon selection is based on imaging uh, measurements. Uh, and, and there is also a big difference for proximal optimization, whether it's due to malopposition. So when, in case, for instance, when the left main was healthy, but you are treating LED left main due to LED osteal lesion, then you only need a position. Then you don't need high pressures, you need diameter. So then uh, you just go up to with a, with a large balloon to achieve good diameter. In the case like what I showed where the left main was heavily calcified, then you need very high pressure also to, to to crack the, the plaque, then uh, you need something with um, high pressure tolerance. What I would say regarding the, the pot balloon, what I have changed based on these observations uh, from, uh, from our bench test, we always suggested before to put the marker exactly to the carina. My belief now it's rather to come a bit more proximal, maybe a one or two millimeter proximal from the carina, because this long shoulder we uh, over over dilate the distal branch ostium, eventually pinching the side branch. So I think to create this uh, real poly polygon of confluence uh, form and uh, the the transition between proximal main branch and distal main branch, I think maybe a one two millimeter proximal from the carina positioning the marker there, it allows you a good enough result. Okay, I think th th this is also answering one of the questions from the audience. What 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 is your workhorse balloon? So, uh, non-compliant balloon when you really need to uh, expand against a, a hard plaque, and a semi-compliant balloon, uh, which is safer when you just want to oppose the the, the sides. I mean the yes. struts to the to the vessel wall. So, yeah. so you already answered one question. <laughs> Which was uh, has been written in the in the chat. So, 